Welcome to the Access to Space for All series of webinars on conducting R&D in hypergravity and microgravity. This is our third webinar of the nine webinar series, and today we will be talking about life science, especially about physiology. So before we begin, um, I'd like to mention a few things. So first, please turn off your cameras and your microphones. We're able to mute you, but we cannot turn off your cameras. So um, please make sure to turn off your cameras. Second, if you have any questions, any comments, please use the chat box. Um, you don't have to wait until the Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, please make sure to write them in. Um, we'll um, collect them all and um, answer them at the end. Also, um, please answer our questionnaire that we will put in the chat box later on. My colleague Wenbin will be active in the chat, putting up useful links and also the questionnaire link. So please make sure to answer that before you leave. And finally, if you are on social media, please use the hashtag access to space for all to help us promote this webinar. We are active on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at UNUSA. So um, I'd like to talk about the webinar schedule. Um, I don't know how many of you have joined us from the beginning, but we've started this webinar series from April starting with the introduction to hypergravity and microgravity. And now we're in the steps of going into each life science, um, each scientific field. So we're beginning with life science. Then after that, we'll go into physical science and technology demonstration. At the end, we'll be talking about available opportunities. So talking about our UN USA opportunities that we have open at the moment. And also we will invite space industry, um, space agencies, sorry, to talk about their regional activities. And the main objective of this webinar series is to really raise awareness of the many R&D done in the hypergravity and microgravity environment and to really trigger interest. And through these webinars, we want to provide theoretical knowledge that can help you um, when you go through these hands-on opportunities that are available at UNUSA and also all around the world. And I don't know how many of you have followed us um, in the past webinars, but um, basically, what we want you to learn through these webinars is really the, the fundamentals, the special characteristics and the advantages of conducting R&D in hypergravity and microgravity, the overview of what type of research can be done. So today will be especially about, about physiology, and we want you to learn about the overview of the available modified um, gravity platforms. So you'll learn about where you can actually conduct these experiments. And lastly, how to develop an experiment to be conducted in this environment. Um, in the first um, webinar, we talked about the different associations. So if you're interested in networking with them or reaching out to them, um, please go to that first webinar as well. So where you can find these past webinars are, well, first, all updates will be posted to our Access to Space for All website that you can see the link up there. And the webinars and recordings will be posted on a different website, which is linked to the first website. So it's called Past Webinars of the Access to Space for All Initiative. Also, you can find the recordings on our YouTube. So make sure that you check that out. I have put it in a folder that says um, hypergravity and microgravity. So sorry, going back. Um, I know all of you have registered um, for this webinar since you're already here, so you do not have to register again for webinars two to nine. Um, you'll just need to register once, so um, all of you do not have to register anymore. Um, and actually, the links for the webinars are all the same. So um, I did send out an email this morning. I'm sorry, it might have been a little too late. Maybe I sent it one hour before the webinar, but um, just to make sure and just so that you understand, all the webinars have the same links, so you can keep using that to join us in the webinars. Okay, um, our Access to Space for All initiative looks like this. Um, we explained about um, this initiative in the first webinar, so um, if you want to know more about it, please make sure to check that webinar out and also our initiative website. Um, currently, we have two opportunities open. One is really related to hypergravity and microgravity because it is drop test, which is an opportunity that you can test microgravity experiments at the brim and drop tower that is open until june 30th and we also have another opportunity in the satellite development track called kibo cube which is open until the end of may um, this is an opportunity that you can deploy your satellite from the international space space station and it's not only about putting a camera on to monitor things you can use this one new capacity to test anything so um 
Although it's a different track, I would say that it's another gradual learning step of the hypergravity microgravity track. So if you're interested in Kiboku, please make sure to check that out. OK, so the agenda for this morning is very exciting. We have first the professional talk for 45 minutes, talking about the physiology research and development done in hypergravity and microgravity. We have Ms. Elisa Fair, who is the senior lecturer and uh, at the Department of Phys psychology at the University of London. After that, we will have a 15 minute student talk um, giving us examples of the actual physiology research and development done in hypergravity and microgravity. So we have Jeremy Rabinu, who is um, from the lab Laboratory of Physics and Psychology at the University Libre de Brussels. And just to um, inform you, in the afternoon, we have the same webinar again, but with different speakers. So for the professional talk, we'll have um, Karen Oker from the SVP Medical Discovery Institute. And we'll have for the student talk, Amalia Luthens from the University of Colorado Boulder. OK, so I've talked enough. I'd like to um, go into the actual topics of today. So we will dive into physiology. I would like to now um, introduce the speaker again, Ms. Elisa Fair. So Elisa is an experimental psychologist and cognitive neuroscientist. She graduated with a PhD in psychology from the University of Pavia, and she is the director of the Vestibular Multisensory Embodiment Lab and senior lecturer of behavioral neuroscience at Royal Holloway University of London. Her research investigates how the human brain represents terrestrial gravity and uses it to guide behavior. Um, she is committee member of the UK Space Life and Biomedical Science Association, UK Space Labs, and also member of the European Low Gravity Research Association, ELGRA. So I will hand the floor over to you, Elisa. I will stop presenting and yep, um, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, um, let me just share my screen and hopefully it's going to work easily. Can you just give me a sign whether you can see and hear me yeah. properly? Yeah, we see everything perfectly. Amazing. All right. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about brain and behavior in microgravity. So this um, human physiology talk is actually give you an introduction about what happened to the body in space, but then we will focus a little bit more on brain and behavior. Feel free to post your questions and I know that I have the tendency to speak very fast so if I'm going too fast try to wave to me some way. Um, I have another screen with your chat so I will try to have a look there if I'm going too fast. Um, all right so let's start. Okay so for today's talk um, here a brief outline. I will start with a short introduction on gravity-related research. So what does it mean to conduct research in altered gravity and how we can use gravity in order to understand some foundation and fundamental things of life on Earth? Um, I will then talk about the effect of microgravity on bodily physiology. So a very brief overview about a couple of different systems and how they can react to uh, different gravity environments. And then I will focus much more on the effect of gravity or altered gravity on brain and behavior. And in particular, I will try to give you an overview of what happened in terms of brain structure in microgravity. So what are the physiological changes that microgravity can induce on the brain? And on the other side, we will discuss some changes in the brain function. So not only there might be some changes in the anatomy of our brain, but also on behavior, on the functions that are uh, essential for interacting with the external environment. And finally, I will uh, present some of our studies um, in which we simulate altered gravity in order to understand how gravity contributes to behavior, how the brain represents gravity and use that to guide us in our everyday interaction with the external world. So before going into the main topic of my um, talk today, I would like to give you a short introduction about who am I. 
So I'm a senior lecturer in behavioral neuroscience at the Department of Psychology at Royal Holloway University of London, and I'm also principal investigator or director of the Vestibular Multisensory Embodiment Lab. So my research is um, focusing on uh, cognitive neuroscience and vestibular physiology. We are going to talk a little bit more about the vestibular system in a few minutes, but essentially it's an organ inside our inner ear which can detect each movement of our head in space. And it can also uh, inform the brain about the magnitude and direction of gravity. So I'm using methods from cognitive neuroscience and vestibular physiology in order to understand how these vestibular cues are integrated with all the other sensory modalities to build up a representation of the external environment as well as our own body in the external environment. And one of the main focus is indeed gravity. I'm also teaching, so I'm teaching behavioral neuroscience um, mainly in year one psychology students with a very large cohort of students. I'm committee member of uh, European Low Gravity Research Association as well as UK Space Labs and I've served in a committee related to the psychology society such as the Experimental Psychology and the British Psychological Society. And another key part of my work is public engagement. So I'm actively involved in different initiatives, um, writing um, for blogs and journals, as well as um, getting involved with uh, educational initiatives from uh, ELGRA and ESA Education, as well as um, some science and art projects, which I hope to have time to discuss about that later in my talk. And I've been asked to tell you about my journey and my journey started in here in the north of Italy. You might have noticed that I have a strong Italian accent. So I originally from Pavia, which is very close to Milan, and I've done my um, bachelor and master in psychology at the University of Pavia. And then I stayed there for my PhD, which is in psychology with a, with a focus on cognitive neuroscience. I did one year in Pavia and then I took the opportunity to go abroad for a little bit of time and then moved to London. I did the rest of my PhD at the University College of London. I got in love immediately with the city and I decided to stay here. So after my PhD, I got a postdoctoral position at University College London, um, which lasted for about four years or so. And that was a super interesting postdoctoral position uh, because it allowed me to visit many different places around Europe. So that was uh, a project that was very much multidisciplinary with many different countries involved. And I had the opportunity to move all around uh, and work with different people with different backgrounds. That was absolutely exciting. So after spending a little bit of time all around Europe, I then came back to London to get my um, lecturer position which became senior lecturer after a couple of years in 2015 and I moved to Royal Holloway which is University of London but if you look here at my slide we are actually outside London in an amazing campus on the top of a hill down here so it's about maybe 29-30 minutes far from um, central London in an amazing amazing building um, and even now that I'm senior lecturer at Royal Holloway, I still have a visiting um, academic position at Osaka, which allows me to spend a few months over the year uh, in Japan, which is absolutely fantastic. And one of the key aspects of my work and my research is having interaction with colleagues from around the world. I think that this is what makes so exciting this type of job. And of course, having interaction with people around the world in terms of educational activities that we are running at the moment. So that's probably why I think I'm so, so much lucky to do research and in particular on this field. So why space? Why doing research related to space? And I would like to use the words of Armstrong who said that uh, I think we are going to the moon because it's in the nature of the human being to face challenges it's by the nature of his deep inner soul, 
we are required to do these things just as a salmon swim upstream. This is probably one of my favorite quotes ever uh, because it can highlight the idea of the challenge. So going to space, space exploration is a real challenge and I'm very much interested in how the brain can face these challenges, how the brain can adjust to challenging environment, to challenging situation. And we know that the brain, the human brain has an amazing ability to do that. So I, of course, have a background in uh, psychology and cognitive neuroscience. So I've always been interested in the brain, but I've been very much interested in how the brain can adjust to challenges, how can cope with very difficult environment. And probably space is at the moment, the most difficult one. So essentially, I managed to combine these two interests and looking at how the brain encode terrestrial gravity, but also how can it adjust to non-terrestrial gravity. Um, but let's go back to Earth. So what is gravity? Gravity is the constant attraction that our planet exerts on all the objects is the finest 1G, which correspond to 9.8 meter by second square. It's a linear acceleration, which is affecting all the objects and therefore our body and therefore our brain. So gravity is always there, is pretty much always the same. And as Albert Einstein say, is the first thing which you don't really think about. You cannot really perceive it. You cannot perceive it as you would perceive a different color or a sound or some tactile stimuli on your skin. So it's a sensory information somehow, but you don't really perceive it as you perceive all the other sensory cues. Now, I would like to focus your attention on the fact that 1G is not a small acceleration. It's quite an interesting one, and you can probably lift a glass of water or a cup of coffee without effort. Now, just to think about how amazing is your brain, what does it mean to lift a glass of water? Well, it means that there is one G acceleration that is going on this direction, downwards, but your brain needs to take into account the one G acceleration in order to coordinate all the muscles, tendon of your arm and making this movement. Do you feel any effort in doing that? Probably not. So we are so much adjusted to this 1G acceleration that we can interact with it without almost no effort. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's just so interesting to study how the brain represents gravity and uses for behavior. Before we move into the talk, I would like to uh, give you a couple of definitions such as that we are all on the same page and I apologize if you know that already. So um, I'll try not to be too boring. Um, what does it mean microgravity? So microgravity is defined as a state of very little gravity, is often used as synonymous of weightlessness or zero G. And actually the prefix micro means small. So it means that the gravity is less than the usual 1G acceleration. So on one side we have microgravity, on the other side we have hypergravity, which means that the amount of gravity exceed the one on the surface of our planet. So when we talk about hypergravity, we intend an amount of gravity that is higher than 1G. So an example of microgravity environment might be ISS, the International Space Station, while for hypergravity, we might consider a centrifuge as a good simulation of altered, increased amount of gravity. So just to sum up, Microgravity is less than uh, terrestrial gravity, often used as weightlessness and zero g synonymous. Hypergravity means more than the amount of gravity that we have on the surface of our planet. Why is important to do gravity-related research and what is the aim of gravity-related research? Well, gravity-related research aims to increase our understanding of the effect of gravity on different systems. So there are people working on the biological systems, physical system, and even chemical systems. So it's a very large field with many different potentials. And to me, what makes this field very much fascinating is that it's intrinsically multidisciplinary. So 
it combines life sciences, physical sciences, engineering. And sometimes you might find yourself working with colleagues from completely different fields in order to build up and create a, a gravity related experiment. So it really gives you the opportunity to interact with people from completely different environments. And also it's multi-method. So it's probably one of the few fields of research in which most of the time we combine different methods in order to address a question. And this method can range from lab-based type of experiment in which in the lab we try to simulate altered gravity conditions or ground-based experiments in which we are using facilities in order to simulate um, different type of gravities and even space flight. So sometimes in order to address a specific research question, you find yourself working with people from different disciplines as well as using different methods. And I do believe that this really gives you the idea of how cool is this type of research because it allows you to be very creative. Importantly, gravity related research is not only about answering some gravity related questions, but it can also have an uh, important economic, industrial and societal impact and it might shape the way in which we live our life on Earth. In terms of methods, I mentioned that it's multi-method in the sense that we are often using different type of methods to address a research question and mainly we can identify space flight uh, resources in which we are exploiting um, space flight to do research and those can vary from satellites, payload and the ISS which is the International Space Station. But on the other side, more often we use ground-based facilities. So those are different type of facilities that you can find around Europe and the world in which um, both microgravity and uh, hypergravity can be uh, simulated. And of course, in function of your research question and the type of research that you are conducting, you need to decide which one fits best to address your question. But essentially, you can see here that there is a, a very nice set of different opportunities. Now, if we are just focusing on human physiology, some of them do not work for human physiology. So satellite payload, clinostat and drop tower are definitely not for human experiments. But if we are interested in um, different systems in terms of human physiology, there are options for us, such as the ISS, if we are uh, planning to study uh, some research question directly on astronauts living in space, or we can use bed rest, parabolic flight and centrifuge for simulation of microgravity and hypergravity. A little bit more in detail, bed rest can simulate weightlessness in terms of um, the physiological aspects of weightlessness. We have participants stay in the bed, uh, with the head slightly tilted, normally six degrees below the feet. So the head is here and the feet are pretty much here. And they can stay there for three months or so. And we can look at the effect of um, bed rest on the bodily physiology. Another opportunity is the parabolic flight in which uh, both microgravity, zero G and hypergravity, 2G, 1.8 are um, simulated during the flight. We will go into parabolic flight a little bit later. And also centrifuges in which the spinning of the centrifuge can increase the amount of G and can simulate different G load at the level of the feet or the uh, torso of our participant. And you can also think about placing participants supine or seated or even asking them to do some cool exercises while they are on the centrifuge. So there are many different possibilities. The key aspect is that it's very much multidisciplinary and you can be creative. So you can really come up with uh, experiments that can fit in uh, these facilities. Am I going too fast? Don't see any comments in the chat, so probably it's fine. All right. So human physiology in microgravity. We have an amazing ability to adapt to new situation and demands from um, the external environment. So here I just put a couple of pictures of some extreme situation in which people are perfectly adjusted to live in a very hot environment, in a very cold environment, and they managed to do that very successfully. So we do have 
this ability to continuously and successfully adapt to the external environment. However, how the space can be considered the ultimate frontier, a real challenge to the human adaptive capabilities, is not easy to live in outer space. Why? Well, because there are many different uh, physical challenges that our body need to deal with when it's in outer space. There is radiation, there is microgravity, acceleration, Isolation, we had an idea in the last year about what does it mean to be isolated and it's not easy. So think about being on an isolated trip to Mars. Um, and also there is a quite high level of stress. This is not just in terms of behavioral stress, it's also in terms of um, our bodily physiology responding to a stressor and changing the physiology uh, aspect. So radiation, microgravity, acceleration, isolation and stress it's not easy to cope with all of them. And it's very important to understand how the human body responds to all these stressors, but in particular microgravity, in order to ensure the success and safety of human space missions. This is absolutely true for current space missions in terms of um, going to the uh, ISS. But if you consider deep space exploration, Mars, going back to the moon, those aspects are even more important. So the challenge is that a trip to Mars is going to, is asking us to face, are even higher than the one that we are currently facing. So understanding how the body responds to all these stressors, and in my opinion, in particular, microgravity, is essential in order to ensure the safety of uh, the human space missions. So what happened to the body in space? Well, microgravity, I'm going to focus much more on microgravity. Microgravity causes dramatic alteration in bodily physiology in different systems. This is one of the uh, visible alterations that we can immediately spot when uh, humans are in microgravity. So you might have recognized him is um, astronaut Tim Peake, and this is team just before going on the ISS, and this is team on the ISS. And of course, team is looking absolutely beautiful, but you might have noticed that when team is on the ISS, his face gets slightly different. So it's called puffy face, which means that the fluids are going up. There's no longer gravity, and the face is going to be a little bit like, like that. So this puffy face is just something that you can easily spot when you look at astronauts on the ISS, which means that something is happening to the bodily physiology. And many things are happening that we cannot even see them. So the fluid starts to shift from the legs to the head, hence the puffy face. And this shift might be around two liter, which is not a small one. Uh, what does it mean? It means that all the cardiovascular system need to readjust in order to uh, cope with the shift of fluid that from the left go up to the head. There is a reduction in bone density, which is around 10, 12% reduction. And because there's no need to counteract gravity, muscles start to shrink and they also absorb the extra tissue from their lack of use. So no need to put any effort to counteract gravity and therefore muscles start to shrink. Vision also might get worse because of the fluid that are shifting toward the head, which might increase the pressure at the level of our brain. And there are also some uh, structural and functional things happening to the brain that we will discuss in a little bit of time. And this brings me to the point that we are perfectly adjusted to the terrestrial gravity environment. Life on Earth has developed in 1G environment, and our bodily physiology strongly relies on gravity. Gravity has always been the same, pretty much. It's always been there, and therefore our bodily physiology relies on 1G acceleration. So just an example, the evolution of the cardiovascular anatomy. So gravity places special demands on the cardiovascular system of animals and humans. And I'd like to uh, talk about that with an example, which is related to snakes. So the gravity's effects can um, 
be particularly evident in how the cardiovascular anatomy is evolved in different types of snakes, whether they were uh, climbing snakes or whether they were living in water or just on the terrestrial surface. So here you can see the heart in the little dot in the red, and you can see the difference in the system of these three snakes. So essentially the evolution of the animal adjusted to the, the, the amount of gravity and to the function that the animal had to do in the environment in order to have an optimal system to cope with the demand of the environment as well as the demand of gravity. And here you can see that the systems are different in the three types of snakes. So suggesting that uh, three snakes is perfectly adjusted to the idea of climbing up compared to a water one and the, system, the cardiovascular system, the cardiovascular anatomy can perfectly cope with that. And the same is with human. So our cardiovascular system is perfectly adjusted to terrestrial gravity. And as soon as the usual, the comfort of terrestrial gravity is not longer there, many things start to happen. So upper entry into microgravity, the hydrostatic pressure is suddenly removed from the bodily tissue, which means that there is a migration of the fluid from the legs to the upper body and the head. And you can see this in the schematic here. So you can see the cardiovascular anatomy on Earth and how this is going to change in microgravity. So here, of course, the blood is going more toward the, the, the feet uh, with the heart that is pumping up, while in microgravity, the system is completely changing. And in the post-flight, you need to readjust again. So those are physiological changes that occur in our bodily physiology once the usual 1G is not longer there. I mentioned the puffy phase, which is caused to this um, change in the fluid that you can see here. But we can observe a similar effect in the legs. So the, um, the blood is going up. There's no longer gravity, so the blood is going up. And the legs look like uh, bird legs or chicken legs. And as I mentioned, there are, of course, effects in the structure of the brain because suddenly all these fluids are going up to the head and might create a pressure and differences in the brain structure. So the brain starts to be a little bit compressed uh, uh, on our head, which doesn't seem great, right? So we also know that uh, people can adjust to these changes. So you can see astronauts perfectly of working and doing experiments and fixing the ISS, but we know that there might be some, um, there might require some time in order to adjust from 1G environment, 0G, and again 1G environment. And a nice example is what is called post flight orthostatic intolerance. So here we are looking at the video of an astronaut that came back from the ISS and is giving a uh, press conference um, the day after, I do believe. And you can see what happened to her while she is engaged with the press conference. So keep in mind, 1G, we have this sort of um, configuration of the cardiovascular system. In um, 0G, the fluids goes back. So it means that our heart needs to pump in a different way in order to adjust to this lack of gravity. And as soon as we are back on her, the gravity is back and therefore there needs a little bit of time to readjust to this 1G acceleration. So I, fingers crossed, I tried to show you the video and let's see what happened to her. And when I finally got to go out the door, that was something different too. And I figured that would never happen without the uh, preparation we had training the team. And so I'd like it. <coughs> All right, so she was engaging in the press conference, she was speaking and suddenly she faint because of this orthostatic intolerance that is often happen after flight. So the time that's required to our bodily physiology to get back used to the presence of the 1G acceleration. 
So we said that life on Earth has developed in 1G environment, and I discussed the um, cardiovascular system as an example, but loading bearing structure can be another example. We don't need muscles and joints working in the same way in space compared to Earth, and this can also be affected by the lack of gravity. We know, for example, that one of the side effects of microgravity is that this removing the G load on the spine means that uh, there is a lengthening of the spine. So essentially, people are getting taller, um, which is not necessarily a great thing because they start to experience pain. And back pain is one of the main issues in astronauts. So colleagues has been working a lot and hardly on developing a skin suite which allow to prevent this back pain and the lengthening of the spine by simulating gravity spinal compression. But now, um, how do humans know about gravity? Well, we know about gravity because our human brain can detect about it. Now, the human brain, the human brain is the most amazing object in the entire universe. All the amount of knowledge, all the skills that we have, everything is produced by our brain. So I cannot think about a, a better object than the human brain. And the human brain, of course, has a big role in detecting gravity and um, interpret it and allowed us to react to change in the gravitational load. This is the human brain. Actually, this is my beautiful brain. Uh, it's very complicated. This is an MRI scan, and you can see all the brain structure, um, the cerebellum here, the cortex. It's very, very complicated, and we don't know yet too much about it. It's just absolutely beautiful, complicated object. And one of the key aspects about the human brain is its ability to learn. It, the ability to change in function of the demands of the environment, which we call brain um, plasticity. So it's the ability of the brain to reorganize neural pathway based on new experiences. So it's essentially the ability to change with learning. It's the ability to represent new knowledge. And importantly, this ability is strongly related with the feature of the environment. So now here I'm showing you um, the neural connection, let's say, of a mice in a very poor environment with no stimuli, a boring cage. Well, you can see here the amount of neural um, connection of a mice in which, which is living in an environment full of different stimuli with other friends, with toys, with food, lots of different things. And you can see that in terms of neural connection, there are many more neural connections in the enriched environment compared to the impoverished environment. So how our brain can adjust to um, the feature of the external environment. And therefore, the environment itself can influence the neuroplasticity. So we need to think about that when we plan these space uh, missions in order to understand how the neuroplasticity can change in those challenging environment. How does the brain detect gravity? Well, it does that with the vestibular system. Um, the vestibular system is, is my passion, is my love. Uh, it's a tiny, small, sophisticated organ inside the inner ear, which detects each movement of our head in space and translate the movement in terms of linear and angular acceleration. So every time that you move your head like this or like that, the vestibular system is immediately telling the brain the position of your head in space. It's traditionally association with motion, balance, and orientation, but it's also key in uh, telling the brain the magnitude and direction of gravity. How does it work? Well, it's very complicated, but if we make the story simple, we need to zoom in into the vestibular system down here, and in particular into the autorit organ. So those are little stones, many of them, that are lying on a fluid, which is this one here. And in the fluid, there are many receptors, which are those cells here, which are then connected to the nerve and the brain. So essentially, if your head is upright, probably as it is right now, 
the otoliths are perfectly on balance on this fluid. But let's imagine that you are making a movement. You do this movement here. And in this case, because there is terrestrial gravity, the otoliths start to shift, so the stones start to move. The fluid is, of course, moving, and this movement can make the receptor um, binding a little bit, which is going to trigger an action potential to the brain and immediately telling the brain, oh, wait a moment, your head is no longer upright. So with this uh, very fast mechanism, the brain knows exactly whether your head is um, upright or in any other different direction compared to the gravitational one. Now, the vestibular system is unique. It has a unique uh, brain architecture. There's no unimodal cortex. That means that many different areas of the brain, the one in peak here in the picture, respond to both vestibular signals and cues from other sensory modalities. So this is completely different compared to all the other sensory modalities, compared to vision, compared to touch, compared to the auditory system. The vestibular one is the only one with this spread uh, brain architecture, which might suggest a key role of vestibular gravitational signals for our behavior. As I mentioned, um, microgravity can affect the brain structures. And this has been shown with uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging studies, that have been looking at the brain structure, the structural connectivity, so how different areas are connected of uh, people that have been in space. So this is one of the um, most interesting studies um, in the last few years that has been show the change in connectivity of a cosmonaut after having been more than 150 days in space. And they found that the connectivity was changed in a particular brain region, which is the insula down here. So it's this um, dot, blue dot in the picture. And the insula, the right insula, is a region of the brain which is a vestibular region. So not surprising, there was, after more than 150 days in microgravity, less um, links between this area and all the other nearby. And not surprising, this area is one of the key uh, vestibular areas, suggesting that the lack of gravity might have changed not only how the vestibular system peripherally was processing the signal, but also the brain structures. It has also been shown that the space flight leads to an increase in the ventricles, which are those areas here, containing the uh, cyber uh, fluid, which might also change because of the pressure that we have discussed earlier. And as well as changes in electrocortical uh, activities measured by EEG. So during EEG, we place many electrodes on the head of our participant is completely not invasive. We can record the uh, waves from the brain. And when people have recorded um, these brain waves, they found that there was a reduction in the alpha power. Well, there was an increase, sorry, in the alpha power, which means that the brain was a little bit more slow or a little bit more relaxed than usual when you ask a participant to open the eye. So again, a link between differences in the structure, changes in the structure, and changes in the function. So, okay, there are changes in the structure, but how does the brain build up a gravity model to allow us to interact with the external environment? Well, clearly it uses um, vestibular cues, but this is not enough. It also uses vestibular, uh, sorry, visual information from the external environment, we can spot immediately whether an object is not aligned with the vertical, with the direction of gravity, as well as information from proprioception. So information from the muscles, the joint, uh, our legs, our arm, about where our body is uh, in respect to gravity. So the brain is using vestibular cues but is also using visual and proprioceptive information, which means that is always integrating this different signal to build up a model of terrestrial gravity, which we can call graviception. So it's taking vestibular, visual, proprioceptive information, is combining them, and is also using our semantic knowledge about the fact that we have gravity. And it does that every single 
moments, seconds of your life without you not even be aware about that. Isn't that just amazing? So keep integrating all these different sensory cues, combine them with the semantic knowledge about the fact that we have gravity on Earth and provide us with a model that allowed us to interact with the external environment. It's just, whoa. So what happens if this gravity model doesn't work? So this model is perfect for Earth. What happens if it doesn't work? Well, on Earth, the vestibular signal can tell the brain that we have 1G acceleration and where is our head in function of this 1G acceleration? In space, this is gone. So the gravity reference is no longer there. This means that our brain needs to take into account visual, proprioceptive and semantic knowledge of gravity and readjust completely in order to create a new model that can explain the external environment. That's not easy and it takes time. And this may be one of the reasons why more than 80% of astronauts, as soon as they go into uh, space, they start to experience a very strong motion sickness, which is called space adaptation syndrome or space motion sickness. So think about the worst motion sickness that you have experienced, multiply that by time, and this might give you an idea about astronauts' motion sickness. So it can involve nausea and vomiting, but also it can generate perceptual illusions, can generate um, difficulties in coordinating movement, disorientation, and of course, low uh, performance. So space motion sickness is a problem. It doesn't solve, but it can get much better if at some point people start to rely on visual or proprioceptive information rather than the altered vestibular one. So as soon as people start to use different references compared to the gravitational reference, things get much better. And we know that microgravity can alter um, behavior in many different ways, not only in terms of motion sickness. Perception and motor control are impaired during space flight. Um, there are effects on proprioception, on vision, on vestibular signaling, as well as the integration of these sensory modalities. And at the same time, there are also uh, issues in terms of balance and muscle control. So here is um, a video of someone trying to um, walk on the lunar surface. I mean, walking is very easy for us. Look at this. It's challenging. The usual G-load is not longer the same, and even walking, which is a very easy, automatic action for us to do on Earth, might get very difficult. So we know that um, postural control, walking is impaired, grip force, as well as goal-directed movement and eye-hand coordination can be difficult in space. So they can be very difficult at the beginning and then people can adjust to them. I quickly skip that. So what are we doing in the lab in order to study microgravity? I decided to take an approach in which I've combined uh, space methods in terms of uh, parabolic flights and centrifuges with a uh, lab simulation of gravity. And here I'm presenting some of the data that we haven't published yet about pain perception. Now, pain is a very interesting signal because it has an adaptive function. It's very important for our interaction with the external environment. And essentially, we have found that during a short duration bed rest, there was an analgesic effect. So people were feeling less pain compared to the upright condition. So this is with participant upright, and this is participant uh, possibly tilted in head down bed rest with the head down below the feet. And we found there was an analgesic effect such as they feel less pain when they were uh, in this position. Now, the pain is acute pain, so it's painful stimuli on the skin, and they feel less pain. Now, how can we combine this space method with lab alteration of gravity? Well, we are exploiting a lot virtual reality. Virtual reality is absolutely fantastic because it can trick our brain to feel something that is not actually there. So this is a mechanism that is called visual capture. So we can use visual information in order to make the brain believe that it's in a different gravity environment. And that's exactly what we have done. 
So we ask participants to stay in virtual reality and look at those videos of a simple ball that was moving according with terrestrial or uh, martial gravitational load. And again, we were measuring their um, pain threshold on the skin while they were looking at the videos. And we found that the pain threshold increased, which again show an analgesic effect. Now, I will keep it short, but please note that being a superhero in a mission to Mars is not necessarily a good thing. So having an altered brain perception doesn't mean a very good adaptation to the external environment. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. We have also shown that uh, motor control is impaired. I'm not going too much into details because I know that I'm short of time, but essentially uh, how participants respond to um, sounds just by pressing a button was much slower in head down bed rest as well as in virtual reality martial simulation. And even more interesting, we found that when we simulated gravity in the lab, the decision making was altered. So the decision making was suboptimal in head down bed rest as well as risk taking behavior. When we measured the ability of our participant to control for uh, hazard or tendency, Surprising, they were showing a much higher risk propensity compared to control condition when they were upright. So here, all the dots are our participants essentially, and you see that in head down bed rest, there was much more willingness to take risks compared to the control condition when they were upright. And again, having a suboptimal decision making combined with a willingness to take risks is something that we need to really take into account when we plan a uh, deep space exploration mission. If I might take out a couple of minutes, I would like to mention that it's also interesting to exploit altered gravity in order to understand life on Earth. So, so far my talk was focusing on how microgravity, how altered gravity might change uh, bodily physiology and brain and behavior. But we can also think about the opposite using altered gravity conditions in order to understand what happened on our everyday life. We have done that uh, by looking at uh, weight perception and in particular the weight of our body. So the weight is given by Newton law as mass by gravity. And of course there are different weight on Earth, Moon or the ISS. Um, we decided to look at how people perceive the weight of their own body in different gravitational environments by changing the g-load here physically. And we have done that during a parabolic flight, um, which essentially involves many parabolas, as this one here, in which we can simulate hypergravity 1.8 g, microgravity 0 g, and again, 1.8 G at the end of the parabola. So as soon as the flight inject, and I will show you the uh, video here, as soon as the flight start with the parabola, there is a hypergravity phase of around 20 seconds, then a free fall phase, which is mimicking uh, microgravity, and then again, an hypergravity phase. And we measure participants uh, weight of the perceived weight of the hand and the head during the parabolic flight. I know this sounds a little bit crazy, but it was totally fine and it was a lot of fun. And we essentially found that there was a dynamic change in the perception of weight when participants were in microgravity or in hypergravity. And we essentially confirmed the same results when we use uh, increased hypergravity exposure on a human centrifuge. And almost all participants got an increased perception of their weight. Now, why is this important and not just a trivial experiment? We know that the way in which we perceive the weight of our body is related to different conditions such as eating disorder, and we those conditions has been normally related to storage semantic representation of the body weight and the body size and the body image, while our study showed for the first time that actual gravitational information might be used to shape the perception of the body and how we represent how our body weight is not at all stored, but is much more dynamic. And another example is by looking at how we perceive art on Earth. Um, 
we know that the concept of verticality, which is very much linked to how we perceive gravity, is actually a proxy for our perception of gravity, has been portrayed in Earth. Uh, it's important to give us an idea of power, morality, and we are often looking around and see vertical objects. And our question here was whether people do like vertical objects much more than any other object. So we use a verticality test, which is this uh, test here in which we present line in many different orientations. It's a very boring vestibular test that we are often doing in the lab to look at how good people are in judging uh, verticality and therefore gravity. It's very boring, to be honest. But here, what we have done was instead of asking whether the line was upright or tilted, we um, asked them, do you like this one or do you prefer this one? So we have many different orientation of the lines and we just ask participants to uh, give us some aesthetic judgment. And what we found is that when participants were upright, they strongly prefer vertical line compared to all the other orientations. Now, when participants were tilted and therefore the vestibular organ were no longer aligned with the direction of gravity, do you think that they still prefer the vertical one? They didn't no preference for vertical lines any longer. So we do have an aesthetic preference for vertical, but only if our body is aligned with the gravitational direction. And this may bring me nicely to the point that we can be creative in our research by looking at these uh, a little bit weird research questions, but also by engaging with people from different backgrounds. And we have recently done one of the most fun experience in my life, which was the Zero Gravity Band project in which I worked with uh, artists, visual artists and um, musicians in order to create a piece of art in a zero gravity environment. Our question was, what does art mean outside planet Earth? And I hope it's OK if I show you the video. I know that I'm running late, sorry. What is one of the biggest questions that we are facing as humanity? What does art mean outside of planet Earth? The Zero Gravity Band is a disruptive scientific and artistic project that starts exploring and experimenting with the potential cultural implications of what it would mean to leave planet Earth. Leaving the planet involves new ways of how art will be perceived and performed. This leads us to a redesign of the classical instruments that use gravity to function. We are not yet aware how attached we are to gravity. We cannot perceive gravity, however, we are very good in telling whether an object is aligned or not with the gravitational direction. We are doing research on how gravity affects our perceptual and aesthetical experiences. For example, we know that curves in general are felt to be much more beautiful than straight lines. The aim of the Zero Gravity Band project is to produce an artwork designed and motivated to be experienced in microgravity. The Sabnak is our first visual attempt at fulfilling these requirements. It's a redesigned classical canvas in three dimensions, adapted to be manipulated and perceived in a 360 free floating environment. The telemetron is a musical instrument designed to be performed in zero gravity. The performers play the instrument by moving it as it floats, spinning, colliding, and gesturing. During this project, the experiences in zero gravity tended to be much more challenging than expected. The reality of being in a completely weightless environment makes us realize how hostile space could be for humans. These experiments are an invitation to start creating a more diverse and inclusive space future. A space for everybody. A space to share, to create, and to listen. All right. And OK, so time to sum up. Um, I hope that I show you very briefly uh, today about how 
Altered gravity can influence how our behavior in terms of sensory processing, motor control, but even high level cognition. Um, the vestibular system and gravity is a very unique modality which um, does not produce any conscious cessation, is always on, we cannot simply switch it off, and I think it's not just a background signal. And this might indeed uh, suggest how gravity plays a fundamental and foundational role in shaping our everyday life and behavior. So thank you so much for your attention and please feel free to ask questions in the chat or later. Um, it was a real pleasure and so sorry if I took a few minutes uh, more than expected. Thank you, Thank you so much, so Elisa, for this presentation. It was really interesting. It um, covered everything from the fundamentals and also to the various experiments that you're doing. Um, I think it was a great um, presentation because it showed a lot of art and uh, the other new things that you can do. And learning about the brain is just amazing. So thank you so much, Elisa. OK, um, for the questions, I I only see a few at the moment. So if you have any questions, Elisa, please send them in the chat. She can answer them on the chat as well, but we'll have a um, dedicated Q&A at the end. Um, I know that was a lot of uh, information, so I've actually posted um, Elisa and Jeremy's presentations on our website already. So um, you can take a look at those. And if you want to ask her detailed questions, please do so. So next, I'd like to introduce our student speaker for today, who is Jeremy Rabinu. So Jeremy is an aerospace engineer from ISAE Superior, France, and he's now enrolled in a PhD in space, phys sorry, like screen, space physiology at the University Libre de Belgium. Um, he already had the opportunity to work on several experiments for the ISS and is now and is passionate about the human aspects of space exploration. His main interest is on the cardiovascular system and how to monitor it easily during the future deep space missions. And besides this, um, he is also the president of the student chapter of the European Low Gravity Research Association, CELGRA. So maybe um, people who joined in the first webinar saw him explain about CELGRA. And I'm sorry, I'm so bad at pro um, pronouncing all the European <laughs> institutions' names, but I know Jeremy will um, give an introduction. So I'll leave the floor to you now. Thank you very much, Azuki. Um, so, Starting sharing my screen, I hope you can see it. Um, okay. Yeah, we see it. Perfectly. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you also uh, to Elisa for the scientific introduction. It uh, actually will help me uh, because I will I will have less things to explain about the, the cardiovascular system. Um, so yeah, the objective uh, right now is to give you a, a concrete example of type of research that we can do uh, even as a student in uh, in the microgravity field. And this typical example in my case would be about how to monitor the cardiovascular system uh, with a wearable device that we describe in the context of uh, simulated microgravity with head-down bed rest. Um, so is it working? Yeah, next slide. Well, the overview of the, the presentation is quite classical, but what I want you to to see the objective of, of this uh, talk is mainly to show you um, that you can do physiology and space physiology even when you are an aerospace engineer or an astrophysicist like me, because um, I switched to space physiology quite late, like four years ago, it means that it is possible and uh, also that there are amazing applications on the earth and I will come back to this at the very end of the presentation. So we'll go back a bit about the context, even though it has been nicely introduced already. Um, so as Elisa mentioned, the position of the heart in the human body is not a coincidence. It's the result of millions of years of evolution. And if it's so high in the human body, it's so that it, uh, the brain can, be, um, um, can get oxygen through the blood, uh, even when you are standing upright. And actually, when you arrive in weightlessness, uh, it is no longer easier to send blood to the feet than to the head. It's the same thing. There is no more privileged direction. So the consequence of this is that you have too much blood going to the face. And I also have my uh, my picture of a puffy face. This time is the French astronaut Thomas Pesquet before and uh, um, after going to space. You see those puffy face. Um, and actually the brain is, again, as uh, was already mentioned, is able to adapt to all these things 
Uh, it's wonderful how the human body is able to adapt to all these kinds of conditions. Um, because very quickly, uh, it will understand that you have too much blood, too much pressure in, in, in the head, and will find ways to get rid of this. So in the first few days of microgravity, um, you will lose a lot of plasma volume, and this will be done through sweat and urine, um, and this will be in the very first days. And after this, the situation in microgravity is the, the picture C, you can see here, it will be uh, at, at the level of the brain will be quite similar to what you have on Earth. Maybe a bit more than, than the terrestrial situation, but uh, but a bit better. It means that you have adapted to this uh, to this environment. You have less blood going to the legs as compared to the Earth, but it's not a big problem because you don't need your legs in microgravity, or not as much. Um, also on the Earth, when you are, for instance, lying on the bed and then uh, standing up quickly, you can see that sometimes you feel dizzy because your body, I mean, your cardiovascular system needs some time to adapt. Um, because when you change position, you need to change distribution of blood, etc. When you are in microgravity, this is no longer the case, and all the sensors that help you to adapt, they will not work the same way or not as much as before. And by neuroplasticity, as also described by Elisa, your, you, you will adapt your systems and you will lose less these sensors. And finally, yeah, you will use less your cardiac muscle because you will not, you won't have to use all the, the muscles as you you are doing on the earth just by standing or standing in upright position or walking. You don't have to do this in microgravity. You just push the wall and you're floating to the end, to the other end of the station. So all these things uh, will cause um, a deconditioning of the cardiovascular system. Um, but when, you, as long as you are in space, you are adapted to this new condition and everything is okay. The main problem is when you go back to the earth, because when you go back to the earth, again, blood is going to the feet. And, no, and not to, to the head or less to the head, uh, which can, may cause problem as been shown in, in the video, you can, uh, that can lead to, to fainting for the astronauts coming back. So uh, in, in a nutshell, the microgravity is a hostile environment for the cardiovascular system and this for many different reasons. So now let's go back to the objective of the, this presentation. Um, it is, uh, this research was aimed at evaluating the impacts of long-term exposure to microgravity, and in this case, simulated microgravity, and this with new techniques that I will describe in a, in a minute called BCG and SCG. And then to compare these new parameters uh, with these techniques with what we are used to have uh, with MRI um, pictures. So you saw the, the brain of Elisa, now let me introduce you to, to my heart. Um, as you can see, the heart is moving. Um, and if it, I mean, it should be the case for you as well. If it's not the case, then maybe you have a, a problem. Uh, if blood is going from one chamber to the other and then to the arteries, uh, everything is moving, the heart is contracting. And, um, and then you can even feel this if you put your, your hand on the chest, you can feel that things are moving inside. When you record these movements, we call this seismocardiography, SCG, and you can record acceleration in uh, rotation or linear acceleration, whatever you want then actually it's not only the heart that is moving. You actually have blood going from the heart to uh, to the head. So you have the, the aorta, the first big artery, going first upward and then downward. Um, and so yeah, these movements of blood, they cause the, the global body center of mass to move a little bit at each heartbeat. And uh, means that the whole body is moving a little bit. And when you record these small movements, we usually you do this in the lower back, close to the center of mass, we call this ballistocardiography or BCG. And for you to remember, uh, SCG is with a S like sternum and BCG is with a B like lower back. And actually, so if you were on the weighting scale and if it was accurate enough, you should be able to see the needle indicating the weight moving slightly as your heart beats. And this is exactly this way that it has been uh, shown. This technique has been discovered more than 100 years ago. So recently, we have found that some of the parameters uh, that we measure with BCG can be correlated to cardiac output, the amount of blood that your heart is able to push per minute. Uh, so you, you, we took volunteers and we um, administrated some medicine to, to increase the contractility of the heart, to increase the cardiac output, and we saw that we had uh, simultaneously an increase with some of the parameters that we measure uh, with ballistocardiography in the lower back. So 
we were wondering, so if it works when we increase the contractility, what will happen when we decrease the contractility? Uh, and this is exactly what happens when you do, uh, when you are in microgravity during a long time. So uh, our hypothesis that we will observe was that we will observe a decrease in our parameters as well during uh, ex uh, extending stay to in microgravity. And that's if uh, you have, uh, for instance, a group of people doing some exercise or some countermeasures to avoid this deconditioning, maybe the decrease will be less for these people. And finally, that is what we see on this SCG and BCG would be correlated what we see with what we see on the MRI. Um, so this took place in a head down bed rest study. Uh, we got 23 male subjects staying during two months, 60 days in such a bed in minus six degrees. And half of them was doing uh, nothing else than just staying in the bed, uh, watching TV. And the other, the other half were, was doing sports uh, three or four, no, six times per week, sorry. Um, so it was basically some jump in horizontal, not horizontal, but head down tilt position that they were doing some kinds of jumps. This is what it looks like. So first two weeks of uh, living a normal life, then 60 days in the bed. And then again, two weeks uh, living a normal life and trying to recover from this experience. This is a, a bit what it looks like when we record these SCG and BCG signal. You have one box in the, in the on the sternum, the SCG, one box in the lower back, the BCG. Um, and this is not very important for you. What you have to understand is we, we take the signals, we do some processing, and at the end, what we get, this you can see on the left, is an average heartbeat. Uh, so this is a record on the on the sternum on the SCG. You have some activity, some movements happening during systole when the heart is contracting, and you also have a bit of activity, but much less during diastole when the heart is filling again. And we compute how the here the area under this curve is evolving, is changing during bed rest and after bed rest. This is the MRI machine that helps us to evaluate stroke volume, which is the amount of blood going out of the heart at each contraction, but also Ventricle mass, left ventricle mass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if you we look at the results, you see in blue the control group, the one doing nothing else than just lying in the bed, and in red the the countermeasure group. We see that in in both cases we observe a decrease in the stroke volume. So, because you have less blood, uh, and you also have a, a heart that is ejecting less blood at each contraction. But this decrease is more pronounced in the control group, which means that when you do some sports, it helps. Um, it helps with deconditioning. You have less deconditioning. If you look at the uh, at the heart mass, the left ventricle mass, you observe a decrease in the control group, where, whereas it's quite stable in the in the jump group in the countermeasure group. But the difference between these two groups, the statistical test shows that it's not significant. So now let's look. So we looked at the MRI data. Now uh, what happens with SCG on the sternum and BCG in the lower back? Uh, these are some examples, sorry for the quality of the picture, but what you see on, on the SCG is that in both cases you observe a large decrease um, on the SCG. It means that something is happening in both, group, in, in both groups in this time, and this, is, uh, this correlates quite well with uh, what we see on the MRI as well. Here we observe uh, during the feeling phase of the heart, and we see also that the feeling of the heart uh, is impaired during, during bed rest. Uh, now the lower back, and this is very close to the metric that I said was correlated with, with cardiac output. Um, we see that just like stroke volume, you, we observe a, a very uh, clear decrease in the control group, uh, but not so much of a decrease in the in the jump group, which means that again, uh, doing some exercise had some effect on, on these metrics. These are some correlations between what we get uh, with our sensors and uh, what we see on the MRI. So you see that I mean, globally, there is some kind of a trend. Uh, here is with the BCG, there is some trend, I mean, some correlation, uh, and it's statistically significant, but that does not explain everything. And this is because what we record are just vibration, and they can be caused by anything, and, it, and not by only one parameter. If you change one other thing, if you change uh, the size of the artery, if you change uh, uh, the heart rate, and so on and so forth, it will change as well. So it's just a global thing that we are recording. But this I will not go into detail because it's very technical. Uh, but also one of the limitations that we could not have MRI measurements and then uh, wearable monitoring measurement at the same time. So for sure it has an impact if, if you take 
for instance, even your heart rate at one time and then one hour later, it will not be the same. Uh, so it's same, the same holds true for uh, BCG and SCG. And also something uh, that you do on MRI is that when you want to measure, uh, to take pictures, you have to hold your breath and holding your breath also is affecting your cardiovascular uh, status. But yeah, and this is what I mentioned that um, the what when you measure a global movement like BCG, this is caused by many different things and most of them are affected by bed rest. Uh, in bed rest, stroke volume is decreasing, heart rate usually is increasing, blood volume is decreasing, peripheral resistance are changing differently in the lower body and the upper body, etc, etc. So it means like uh, there is still a lot to understand with these techniques. We know that some parameters are uh, increasing or decreasing it, but there is still a lot to understand uh, the, the variability that we see. And so to sum up, um, uh, what we found is that these metrics are not only affected by increased contractility, but also decreased contractility when you, for instance, uh, have subjects during two months in head down bed rest. And that you can also see the effect, the positive effect of a countermeasure. Um, and you see some correlation as well with what you see with the gold standard of the MRI, what the cardiologist is using every day. Um, but yeah, still a lot of work remains to be done to better understand these techniques. Um, so what about now? Um, so we had similar devices used uh, in space for approximately 10 years, especially with Russian cosmonauts. And now we have designed a very user-friendly device, a new one, better one, to try and confirm these results we had so far. And we have new projects to evaluate the cardiorespiratory fitness among astronauts uh, to, to see how they react to, uh, to uh, exercise. Uh, because we know that this also is decreasing uh, when they are in space for such a long time. There has also been a startup developed recently uh, by my lab, uh, even though I'm not part of it. They developed an app to record the SCG simply with smartphones. So you just take your smartphone, you just put it on your chest, and uh, you record this because with the sensors inside your smartphone. So this is very interesting and it has many applications. I talked about astronauts, about future exploration, but there are also many applications on the Earth. Uh, for the diagnostic and monitoring of heart failure patients, for instance, uh, but also for valvular diseases, uh, also for sleep monitoring. Very soon, this, uh, our device will go to Antarctica to, uh, to study how sleep is affected uh, in this environment. So now I would like to thank uh, all my team and collaborators, also, uh, also Elgra and also the uh, UN for inviting me and you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jeremy, on this really amazing presentation. We were able to learn about how space affects the heart, but also I learned a lot about how MRIs work as well. So it was really inspiring and interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'd like to move on to the questions and answers. Um, if I'm correct, I only see three right now. So if you have any questions, this is your time. We have amazing professionals here to help you um, answer any questions you have. So make sure that you send it to us while we're still doing the Q&A. And if you have any questions that you want to address them um, specifically, you can also write that in our questionnaire form and we can um, connect um, you, but it would be better if you can ask them here. So, okay, um, I would like to go to the first question, which is from Madhavan. Um, and his question is, does there happen to be an MRI data set of brains for the open source community? So he's interested in if there's an open source data set for MRIs of the brain. I guess this is Elisa, yeah? Yeah, okay. Um, as far as I know, uh, not yet. Keep in mind that the concept of open data and open MRI data is still pretty new, uh, also in other domain. And um, as far as I know, yes, <laughs> the, the answer is unfortunately no. Um, there is also another thing that you might want to consider is about the type of scanning. So, um, and the time from, um, you know, pre and post uh, uh, space flight. So it would be absolutely a great resource, but there might be also some limitations in terms of variability of the type of scanning, the, the slices, as well as the time. So 
definitely something that it would be great to have in the in the future. And I think that open science um, should really uh, be embedded with space research as well. So yeah, uh, abs great questions. Um, as far as I know, uh, not yet. Okay, thank you so much. The next question is from Aaron. Um, his question is, for the next long-term commercial and scientific trips to the moon and our red planet, are countermeasures effective to reduce the effects of microgravity and which ones should be created? Wow, excellent questions. Yeah, there are some countermeasures that we know are very much effective. Um, I briefly mentioned something about the, the spine lengthening and back pain. There is a lot of work on that and it looks quite impressive what they have achieved. I would like to highlight that this is not really the same for the brain. And uh, now, of course, I'm biased and this is probably very much related to my research interest and what I'm trying to put forward. That is the idea that also the brain needs to have some countermeasure. So at the moment, we are uh, looking into a space flight model in which um, well-trained astronauts can cope uh, with alteration of gravity, as well as being constantly in touch with ground. Uh, now, during deep space exploration, this might be different, as well as during commercial space flight. So I think that we might need to put a little bit more effort in order to develop some countermeasure uh, for the brain as well. Think about sensory substitution or try to uh, help uh, adaptation by providing, um, well, artificial signal might be an option. And, and actually, if I may add something that for the moment, when we know very well what happens in 1G uh, and, uh, in Earth gravity, we start to know a little bit what happens in 0G. But it's very difficult for the moment to know what happens in lunar or Mar Martian gravity, so one sixth and one third of Earth's gravity. And this is a whole field of study that is opening at the moment, and we need to really understand what happens in these kinds of environments. We don't know if, for instance, one third of gravity is sufficient for the muscles to just remain as they are, to not decondition too much. Same thing for the cardiovascular system, uh, for the brain as well. We don't know if this these stimuli are sufficient or not and um, and yeah and actually when we go to the moon there are all, uh, other things that happen it's not only about microgravity you also have this uh, this radiation and we know that radiation that have uh, bad effects on many things uh, and also on the cardiovascular system you can have uh, myopathy like problems cardiovascular problems induced by radiation and that's something else uh, that makes it even more difficult it's not only about microgravity so just going back to the microgravity point, I think that in terms of adaptation, um, we have the capabilities to, to adapt. So in terms of, you know, the brain can take time and effort in order to adapt, but it requires time and effort. Now, what it looks to me, the big challenge is the transition. So going from 1G to 0 to 0 0.3, having some acceleration in between, that's really the difficult part. Having the time to um, adjust and try to adjust in a quick and dynamic way, it's probably the main challenge in terms of um, brain adaptation. Thank you both so much. Yeah, I understand it must be difficult with all the different body parts and all the different levels of gravity. So yeah, um, really great question, Erin. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is very technical as well. It's from Zoe. Um, is it known whether microgravity affects the function of the hypo? thalamus, pituitary axis, and endocrine function. I hope I'm reading it correctly, but yeah. So, okay, so um, it's about the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which are basically related to the hormonal changes and stress level and so on. Yeah, there are some studies, both in animal models and uh, humans showing um, changes in the hormonal level. Um, there are very nice studies in uh, human as well um, during space flight ch uh, showing changes in hormonals but uh, i think that one of the limitations that has been highlighted is the fact that it is almost impossible to distinguish between direct effect of microgravity versus other effects the one that jeremy was mentioning earlier that are happening during space flight so level of stress is also physical stress and environmental stress is also very high 
So it's a little bit difficult, at least for um, human studies in during spaceflight, to understand whether these changes in the activity of uh, the hypothalamus and changes in the uh, hormonal level might be related to different gravity load or whether it's more related to the stress response to the environment. Um, excellent question. Thank you. Okay, the last question I see in the chat is from Rowena. Um, one thing that puzzles me about the bed rest studies is whether it is truly possible to eliminate the effects of gravity on the body as a volunteer is still in a gravitational environment and the vestibular system still knows what is up and down. Can you please explain how this is factored into studies? So I, I think um, this was Jeremy. I, I saw you explaining about that, but yeah, I'll give the floor to both of you. Okay, I think it might be more for Elisa, but but yeah, actually you are you are definitely true. Um, I mean, the subjects are still in the bed, but they still see uh, people standing upright next to them. When I know when when they are going, I'm going to see them. I mean, they see that I'm standing. Um, there are many facts that make this environment not ideal, but still better than nothing for many aspects. Um, and for the cardiovascular system, it's it's still okay because. I mean, uh, they can they can only move the head sometimes, but they just they they are not authorized to put a, even a pillow below the head. Uh, so um, so it's not a big problem. Yeah, you're still in a gravitational field, and you still have the effect, even if it's, it's 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 a small effect, but you have this effect. This time, no longer in the head to foot direction, but in more transverse direction, um, which is not a big problem as far as I'm concerned for the cardiovascular system, but it might have an impact on other systems, yes. All right, so if I can add, uh, for the vestibular system is, is a little bit more complicated. So um, in traditional bed rest studies, you have participants um, resting there for uh, weeks, uh, 90 days or so on, so for a very long duration. Now, this can mimic uh, microgravity at the level of the bodily physiology, but clearly there is a very high habituation of the vestibular signal to this new position. So in the studies that I was presenting in my, um, in my presentation, um, we use a different approach, which is not having participants for too long. So for us, what is much more important is that the vestibular system start to trigger a different gravitational signal. And this happens as soon as your head tilts with the respect to the gravitational acceleration, the vertical gravitational acceleration. So um, in the studies that I was presenting, essentially we had participants passively move in head down bed rest, and then they stay there for only a few minutes, and then we, we move back upright and we change different conditions. Also keep in mind that we prevent all the other sensor information. So we have, for instance, head uh, mounted display, so they can only see the experimental stimuli and no other information. The light is always off, uh, they cannot move, they don't have any other proprioceptive uh, information apart of the one that are uh, related to the position on the, on, the, on the bed, on the tilting table actually in our case. So we try to minimize all the other sensory cues uh, coming from the environment. Um, is always a trade-off between perfect experiment and what can be achieved. And I think that this is a very good trade-off, but I absolutely agree that is not uh, perfect. I think I'm just thinking about something, maybe uh, Elisa, you can answer, but maybe this also has an impact that uh, you actually feel the bed along, I mean, on your back. You feel that you are lying, proprioception, you are lying on a bed and you are not floating. So this may also have an impact. Yeah, we try to minimize that, such as that in all the condition there is the same proprioceptive information. So uh, there is content of the skin on the bed um, that is kept constant for all upright, 45 degrees, head down bed rest, upside down completely. So we, we can explore all the range. Um, I also can say that some of this, um, the data that I show you, for instance, the one about um, the ability to respond, so how quickly participants are um, responding to environmental stimuli. So we have also done an experiment with upright and 45 degrees. So this is not actually a head down bed rest condition. So in terms of physiological changes related to gravity, it's definitely not ideal. But in terms of vestibular changes, it's absolutely fine because already at 45 degrees, the vestibular system starts to say, mm, 
not longer upright. So, and we found exactly the same pattern of slowing down the response. So I think, you know, it's very nice to have a multidimensional, multimodal uh, view, but sometimes we need to try to find a compromise to focus on our uh, more specific research questions. So when I use 45 degrees, I know that it's not ideal for the cardiovascular system, doesn't mean a lot, but for the vestibular one, it's fine. So then I need just to say, okay, I'm focusing on this system and I kind of put on the side the other one. Did I answer your question or was way too vague? Yeah. Yeah, let's see if you have any more questions, um, please write it down. I see another one from Zoe, which is asking, do people get bed sores in bed rest studies or how do you prevent that? Are there any cool cushions or yeah, how do you be, um, how do you prevent the bed sores? Um, so actually what happens, I mean, all these things they go through, they go through an ethical committee approval and there are things you can do, things you cannot do. And um, in, among the things you have to do is to ensure that the, the, the subjects, they feel well. Um, and to, to do this uh, every two or three days, they do some uh, stretching. So there is a personal trainer going to, to the, the room of the subjects and they can stretch their legs. They can do some uh, very light exercise. I mean, very light because you don't want uh, to compromise the, the fact that some of them are controlled subjects and they don't need to exercise too much, but just so that they feel well. And actually you have, yeah, it, co it causes some trouble sometimes just to be in this posi position. You have a problem with the nose, you have headaches and things like this. So it can be a trouble uh, sometimes. And there are even some people who think that it is not ethical to have control subjects because they, they say that now we know appro approximately how it works. And if we are only looking for new countermeasures, we need to compare two existing countermeasures or one existing and a new one because they say maybe it's not ethical to have people lying in the bed uh, for, for two months and you say that it is not good for cardiovascular system, muscles and so on. But still, as scientists, it's a bit difficult to accept that you don't have a perfect control group. I do. Um, let me introduce you to Dr. Akur a, a bit more. So Dr. Akur uses the fruit fly and zebrafish to investigate genes that contribute to the heart disease. She has pioneered methodologies that allow her to examine the cardiac effects of the genetic and manipulations in these model organisms, which share surprising similarity with human hearts. Her research focus is on cardiac arrhythmia, arrhythmias and pathological cardiac remodeling. Her work has provided insights into the links between aging, metabolic, metabolic dysfunction, and heart disease. Everything will be explained in her presentation later, so I will give the floor to Dr. Karen Oker. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I am really excited to be here. I want to share my screen with you. Um, and it looks like I am. Yeah, it looks perfect. Okay, great. Um, so what I wanna tell everyone about today is research that we have done aboard the International Space Station and kind of give you an in, some insights into how to use model systems to understand physiological processes. Now, um, it may seem weird to use fruit flies or fish to understand human heart disease, but obviously when you are trying to send things into space, the smaller, the better. And clearly fruit flies are, are pretty small. Um, so what we have, um, so why do we want to use flies to study heart disease? Well, in addition to being small, flies share 75% of human genes. And in particular, from this perspective of the heart, they share muscle structural proteins and things called ion channels, which are critically important to the contractility of hearts. They are small, as I mentioned, and that means, and you'll see why that's important shortly. They also have a very short lifespan. So um, heart disease is impacted by the aging process. 
as most of you are aware, as you get older, your risk of heart disease increases. And so this allows us to, in, to study in a very short period of time the, um, the effects of age on cardiac function. So just to put it in perspective, flies um, about one week old are equivalent to a 10 year old human. So within six to seven weeks, we can go from very young to very old uh, fly models. And the other component that is really critical is we have lots of different genetic tools in the fruit fly. We can manipulate, i.e. overexpress or knock down any gene anywhere, anytime in the fruit fly. And that gives us a lot of power to be able to look at how a particular gene functions just in the heart, for example, or just in the brain. And so it becomes a very powerful model system, even here on earth to use, to understand physiological processes. So how did we get involved in, in studying heart function in, in microgravity? Well, our effort essentially began with a box about the size of this uh, Kleenex box. And it was offered as a prize by uh, Space Florida and NanoRax, the company that makes the box. And um, the prize essentially was the cost of sending that box to the ISS for 30 days and then bringing it back. And the box looks like this. Um, and, and it's basically a very simple container. And we were the, the uh, challenge was to come up with an experiment you could put into this box, send to the ISS and, and learn something interesting. And we won one of three boxes that were um, biology based. And we designed this box with, um, it's called a VFB, a vented fly box. Um, NASA and, and a lot of space agencies really like their acronyms. And it has these very um, uh, small holes that have a wire mesh over them to allow ventilation, but um, they, are, they are completely surrounding um, this box. And the box was essentially going to be filled with um, containers that, that are used to raise fruit flies. So you can see the arrangement here. This is, the, this is a new version of the box with this insert that allows you to put in 15 of these uh, vials. And this is what each vial looks like. And just to give you perspective in terms of size, that's a, a quarter, um, which is about the size of a Euro coin. And um, these are the flies. You can see them inside this vial. There's a stopper to keep them from getting out. And then there's food in the bottom. And the food is both for the adults as well as the um, larva, the babies from these adults. Um, they will burrow into the food and, and they will um, use that to grow and become a new fruit fly. And so a 30-day mission um, aboard the ISS is pretty ideal for flies because that's about um, the time you need to get a fly to be born as an embryo from, from two parents, become uh, larvae, and finally become a pupa, and which then, of course, produces the um, emerging adult fly. And then we would get back after a 30-day mission, we would get back adults that were about middle-aged, um, so two to three weeks old which is about when we start to see heart disease in fruit flies, just as in humans. So we go from 30 hours to six days, and then about four more days to get to the adult fly. So after 10 days, they're born, and then they've got a few more weeks to get old in a microgravity environment. So this was our, our mission. We have uh, the box launched to the ISS, the parents, we sent up about 15 flies in each vial, and those are called the F0 generation. Those are the parents. They had laid uh, eggs that became adults over the 30-day mission on the ISS, and then they came back 
and they fortunately landed um, very close to us here in California. They land off in the water off Long Beach and then are transported to Los Angeles. And I'm in San Diego, so we just drove up the coast and, and got our box and brought it back. So um, for a 35 day mission, however, that means we're going to have both that F0 parents, um, and most of those actually died um, during the mission, the, what's called F1 generation, which is the first set of offspring. But then they're going to start to lay eggs and have progeny, and that becomes an F2 generation. So it was a multi-age cohort, and we, um, so this was a bit of a confusing uh, component of our experiments, but nevertheless, the majority of our flies would have been in that um, middle-aged fly range. So what we got back is shown here. These are the actual flies that came back from the ISS after that first mission. We got about 400 adult flies, uh, which was more than almost more than we could handle, in fact, um, because I'm going to show you how we um, study the heart and the flies, and it's um, it's a bit labor intensive. So um, because of this um, multi-age cohort, we, uh, and, and the fact that aging affects heart function, we were trying to figure out a way to have just a very um, focused set of, of flies that had a very tight age range. And so on our second mission, we did this slightly differently. What we did was we let the parents lay eggs in, in the vial. And then we took the parents out after 24 hours. And then we had a very narrow window of age of the progeny that were in this vial. So then when they went up to the ISS and were aged essentially in microgravity for um, that 30 day mission, we knew that exactly um, the age that they were and then their progeny would only have just started to emerge when they returned to us at the lab. So we can do uh, we can do both. We can get a mixed age cohort or we can get um, a, a very narrow window in terms of age. So um, this experiment that we did, uh, the second experiment, incorporated not just one box, but nine boxes that you can see here. And so we had quite a, a, a range of, of animals that we could fly. So what we did was we ended up sending four or five different um, genotypes. That means animals that have different mutations or express different proteins. And most, and some of them were, um, expressing particular proteins just in the fly heart. And this was um, important for our second, our, our subsequent experiments in the lab. So here's uh, an image of, of that, um, that uh, cargo transfer bag. Uh, I go back. So this is, this is a CTB cargo transfer bag, and all of these VFBs are going to be put into the CTB. And then here it is offloading um, onto the ISS. And we had one uh, replicate of our initial experiment that was held in that CTB, and you can see where the boxes are inserted. And that was just stored on a shelf in, in the ISS. But then we had another set, and you can see those boxes here, that were put into an incubator. And this was, again, a, a way to try and, and keep the flies from getting too old or having too many babies. You can manipulate their development by um, lowering the temperature um, if you want to slow down their development. And so this is an incubator on the ISS that's used for lots of different experiments. But again, you can see how small it is. So um, another plug for using fruit flies in microgravity experiments. Um, there was a problem though, and this is something that um, one has to consider when doing anything in contained environments, such as in, in space. And that is that although the flies that grew up 
in, in the cargo transfer bag on a shelf looked really good when we got them back to the lab. The ones that grew up in the incubator had a ton of fungus on them. You can see it here, this really gross um, black fungus. And obviously that's not good for, um, for the function of any organism to be living in this and eating actually the, the food that's infected with fungus. And we could tell it was coming from the outside, from the incubator itself, because some of the vials would look really nice and clean inside um, with the fungus outside. And, and so you could see that the fungus was permeating through these plugs and getting into the, the um, vials. So unfortunately, we ended up having to throw away all of, all of those flies, but we still had the ones that were kept out on the shelf that were an exact replicate of our initial experiment, which was uh, great because we had we had done a follow-up experiment to, to test something we learned in our first experiment. And I'm gonna show you that in a bit. But first I want to explain how we study hearts, uh, heart function in the fly. And this shows you um, a schematic diagram of a fruit fly and the heart is shown in red. And it's a linear heart. Um, it is not what one calls, a, it doesn't look like a human heart, but it does have four chambers. So there's a chamber here with a val internal valve, another chamber here with a valve, another chamber here, and finally a, a bigger conic, what we call conical chamber in the more anterior part of the heart. Now it's located in the abdomen of the fruit fly and its function is primarily to move nutrients around the animal, just like your heart, except it does not uh, move oxygen in the fly. There's another system that gets oxygen from the outside to the tissues. So the nice thing about that is if this heart doesn't work too well, the animal will still live because it's getting oxygen elsewhere. And so this allows us to um, study badly functioning hearts, which would kill a mouse or a rat or a human. So um, this, this is a, a, an advantage in fact of, of this particular system. What you probably don't know is your heart starts out linear during embryological development and it's only later during development that the heart starts to what we call loop and form the more complex organ that we're familiar with. But in any event, we've learned a lot about development of the heart from this model organism, from the fruit fly. And there are many similarities in terms of the genes that control heart development um, uh, and the genes that control your heart development. So these are among the reasons why we think this is a really good model system for understanding heart function. So how do we study it? Well, what we do is um, we dissect the fruit fly open and what you're seeing here is a magnification of this region of the heart right here. And you can see the heart tube is right here. And then these are some support cells that are um, called pericardial cells around the fly heart. And what you should notice from this is that it, it's beating after we've removed the head and all the internal organs, this heart still sits there and beats. That is, it's a myogenic heart, which is just like your heart. If you took the heart out of any mammal without nervous input, it would still continue to beat. So another similarity between the fly and humans. We can also study them um, without dissection now. We've recently uh, developed a, a more high throughput method to look at heart function because we can express this fluorescent protein that you're seeing here just in the heart muscle. And that allows us to then take movies without opening up the animal. We can do it right through the abdominal cuticle, the abdominal covering. And um, it, this can be done in a more rapid way than by dissecting a tiny little fruit fly. 
And what you're looking at here is you can see one of those internal valves right here that are keeping, they basically keep blood flowing in one direction. And these are the inflow tracks called ostea, where the hemolymph, the blood of the fruit fly come in and then get pumped. So we have a couple different ways now that we can uh, rapidly look at heart function in the fly. So what did we find? So normally what you see in, in a ground control or a wild type fly is this heart tube right here. And within the heart tube are these um, heart cells that have myofibrils. That's the this little striated strip here that you see um, running across the heart. These are the contractile elements of the fly heart. So this muscle fiber, when it contracts, will squeeze the heart tube, just like you would squeeze a tube of toothpaste, and that will force the, the blood of the animal out. And you can imagine that with this kind of arrangement of the myofibrils is very efficient at, at squeezing. What we found when we um, looked at the hearts from our space raised flies is hopefully you can appreciate that they're, first of all, they're a little smaller in size, and these fibrils that are responsible for contraction are quite disorganized and in some cases running the wrong way. If these myofibrils contract, they're going to shorten the heart as opposed to squeezing it. And so it, you, can, you can appreciate, I hope, that a, a tube with myofibrils oriented in this circumferential manner are much better at pumping than those that were disorganized as a, as a result of being um, uh, raised on the ISS. So this is, this is a, a first piece of information that we got that the microgravity environment, perhaps inactivity, but probably other things are disorganizing um, muscle structure. So now the other thing that we found, which was also interesting, is there was a change in the sort of support network, the fibrosis around the heart. And fibrosis is a, a component of many disease states, or I should say excess fibrosis. Um, in terms of uh, the fly heart, you can see there's this in green, this extensive collagen network surrounding the, flat, the heart muscle itself. And it kind of gives the muscle a point of attachment that allows it to contract and exert force. In the case of the space flown flies, we were predicting that we would see more fibrosis because it's a, it's a hallmark of disease. And in fact, we saw quite a bit less. You can, I hope, get the impression that there's a lot less of this um, connective tissue, this um, extracellular matrix collagen in this part of the heart than there is in the ground controls. And the, you can see here how the collagen interacts with the muscle fiber shown in red. Um, and, and it's probably because the muscle fibers get disorganized that they start to lose their attachment to this important extracellular matrix. And we, um, after we examined um, all of our fly hearts for um, heart function, we removed them um, from the, the animal and ground them up and then looked to see what genes they were expressing. What was the difference in terms of the gene genetic makeup of the heart? between a ground control and a space flown fly. And what we found paralleled what we saw in the, phys in the physiology and morphology of these animals. We saw a reduction in muscle proteins and we saw a reduction in genes that were coding for these collagens. The other thing we found was really interesting and also consistent with this sort of general breakdown of muscle uh, 
muscle fibers. We saw increased expression of almost all the subunits of something called a proteasome. Proteasomes are essentially your cell's garbage disposer. What they get are proteins that are damaged and uh, need to be degraded. They go through the center of this proteasome. So if you turn that structure on its side, this is what you would see. And it has a, a sort of a channel that goes through the middle of the proteasome. And in the process of making its way through this structure, proteins get degraded and they can then be reused, recycled. So it's essentially a, a, a recycling system that gets rid of bad proteins and produces good ones or produces components that can be used to make good ones. And of course, um, in any muscle, uh, when it is being, uh, when it's contracting and functioning, eventually those proteins get stretched, damaged, broken, and need to be recycled. And that's what this um, particular uh, component does in cells. And what we saw was that most of those components all of these genes here in the proteasome showed an increase in, the, in their expression. So this we learned from our first mission and we wanted to understand if that, or we wanted to test to see if that was really what was happening. So in our second mission, what we did was we sent up flies that were expressing a, a, a fluorescently tagged protein that has a tendency to, to clump if it's damaged. And so you can see that protein here in, in green clumps in a ground control um, part. And that protein, um, in addition to, to this um, polyq express, GFP expressing protein, we also look to see how that was associated with proteasomes and we used an antibody against proteasomes to be able to visualize it. And here you can see that um, there's a number of places where you have an association between the proteasome and clumped, probably misfolded damaged proteins. And so this is what we saw in the ground control. And we used this particular fly line to send up to the ISS to see what happens in microgravity. And what you can appreciate here is that there's a whole lot more of sort of general green haze in the space flown fly heart, indicating that there's just a lot more of this um, protein being made and, and clump, starting to clump. And then there's also much bigger clumps um, throughout the heart here. And as you would expect, there's big clumps of these proteasomes that are probably trying to degrade these damaged proteins. And you can certainly see that um, in the merge here where you see both um, a, a proteasome uh, aggregate and this misfolded protein aggregate. So the prediction that we had from our first study, we were able to confirm in our second study. And it certainly suggests that, um, that there's a, a significant rearrangement, um, degradation of muscle proteins under microgravity that probably accounts for this decreased cardiac size. And we saw decreases in contractility in our functional measurements. Um, as I indicated before, we also saw this reduction in, in cardiac fibrosis, both morphologically as well as in our uh, gene expression analysis. Um, the, the loss of muscle protein was certainly um, reinforced by gene expression, mRNA, seq analysis, and we saw defects in proteasomes. So all of these are giving us clues as to where we can potentially go in and target um, uh, target um, ways to keep these things from happening in, um, in humans that are spending a lot of time on the moon or on the ISS or just in, in space um, in general. And this isn't just 
something that is relevant for space travel. It's also relevant for people on Earth because people who are um, confined to bed rest for extended periods of time or infirm people or older people who don't have the ability to move around on their own experience cardiac uh, problems. They experience cardiomyopathies and it's likely due to some of the same fundamental um, cellular mechanisms that we are studying when we look at what happens in space to these muscles. So all of this suggests that we need to really get at the basic fundamental mechanisms, cellular mechanisms um, underlying muscles responses to uh, altered gravity. And so what we're doing now is we're trying to um, we're trying to understand the all or whether these responses are an all or none response or do they have a continuum um, in terms of uh, relative effects to different gravities. And this is important because NASA is going back to the moon with their Artemis program. They have a base planned. Um, and the idea is to have a mission to Mars by the 2030s. So we need to assess a number of different gravities, not just microgravity on the ISS, but also lunar and Mars gravity. And we are proposing to NASA right now to, um, to study different gravities using, um, using this MVP, a multi-variable gravity platform that allows us to look at different, um, uh, different gravities as well as to precisely um, separate the different generations of flies. And essentially what it has are a couple food cylinders shown here and here, which are accessible um, to astronauts on the ISS and chambers that the flies can go into. And, and we have a way to kind of move the flies through this uh, MVP in ways that we can then know for sure how old they are. And then that MVP is put into a centrifuge, essentially a centrifuge with two platforms that can be rotated at different rates. So allowing us to generate artificially different gravities aboard the ISS. And we can use this same kind of approach for another model system called C. elegans. It's a tiny little worm that is like Fruit flies also used for aging research, and um, they grow in these culture bags that um, have been adapted um, and put into these MVPs. And so our proposal is to use two systems. Oh, I should mention. Um, so this, the way this works is that there are parasolitic pumps that push fluid through the bags, and there's a microscope and camera that can record um, the actual function and behavior of the worms. And so that can be put both of them in the same platform. And so that just shows you where, how it gets shoved in here. Um, and then we can compare gravity effects, um, it, both in fly brain. So this is our proposal to look at fly brain as well as um, fly muscle and fly heart in terms of um, how well th the, the cells are recycling their proteins through both proteasomes as well as another process that's referred to as apoptosis. And we have stains that allow us to visualize what's going on, including um, looking at mitochondria and ATP synthesis. And we are going to also compare worm brain um, and, and look for the same kinds of markers, both in worm brain as well as in worm muscle. And then this will allow us to add, hopefully answer the question of what keeps organisms from losing muscle mass in space and simultaneously test four gravities between two organisms and in two different tissues. And that will um, hopefully allow us to, com by comparing these two systems and multiple gravities, 
come up with the conserved fundamental um, uh, components that are involved in maintaining muscle mass, both in microgravity, but in other altered gravities, as well as potentially with relevance to humans. And these are all the people that are involved in both the studies that I um, we've already performed um, from my lab as well as another uh, lab at, at Sanford Byrne and Prebis Medical Discovery Institute. And these are our collaborators from NASA Ames who were participating in the first two studies. And I have new collaborators um, that are um, hopefully gonna participate in a subsequent study if NASA decides to fund us. And I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you so much, Dr. Okur. That was a lot of information, but it's all truly interesting about the physiology through fruit flies. And um, to everyone, um, as my colleague Wenbin has been mentioning, um, the presentations are already on the website, so um, you can um, download it and take a look at it while you listen to the um, webinars. If you have any questions to um, Dr. Okur, um, make sure to put it in the chat because we will be answering the questions at the end. I see already a few really interesting questions. So yeah, we'll do that at the end. So thank you so much, Dr. Okur. Okay, next I'd like to move on to our student um, speaker session. So let me introduce to you Alma. So Alma is currently studying at the University of Colorado Boulder and she's majoring in neuroscience and minoring in both business and molecular cellular and developmental biology. She has a passion for space life sciences that began when she worked for the Colorado Space Grant Consortium on a microbiology project where her team studied um, changes in E. coli K-12 metabolism um, during a weather balloon flight. Um, she will definitely explain more of that. Um, more about that later. Um, this summer, she'll be working for NASA Ames Research Center as one of the staffers for the Space Life Sciences, Sciences and Training Program. So I will give the floor now to Alma. And yeah, um, go ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, let me just share my screen really fast. Can everyone see that? I don't know. Yeah, we see it perfectly. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. My name's Alma, and today I'll be talking about two projects, but the one I'm gonna focus on is called the Effects of Simulated Microgravity and Placental Expanded, or PLX pad treatment on behavior and correlation with cytokine profiles in female mice. So I know that sounds like a lot, but I promise I will break it down for everyone. But before I get into that, here's just a little bit about me. I'm 21 years old and I'm an incoming senior at the University of Colorado Boulder, majoring in neuroscience and minoring in both business and molecular biology. So I have no engineering background, which means I had no clue I could even do space research until 2019 when I did a research project with Colorado Space Grant Consortium where my team and I, and we're all up here, <laughs> studied changes in E. coli K-12 metabolism throughout a weather balloon flight. So this is our weather balloon and this balloon just took our payload, which is this box right here, all the way up like about 108,000 feet, like so pretty much to the edge of space. And we studied E. coli in our little in our little box. So that's pretty awesome. And then last summer, I interned for NASA Ames Space Life Sciences training program where I worked on the projects that I'm gonna talk about today. And then this summer, I'll be working as an SLSTP mentor. So now a little bit of background information on my project, which again is called the effects of simulated microgravity and PLX pad treatment on behavior and correlation with cytokine profiles in female mice. <laughs> All right, so unfortunately, we cannot send every experiment that we want to into space. So to compensate for that, we've developed microgravity analogs. And these analogs are super, super useful, especially when we're using model systems like mice, which is what I use, because mice are you know, pretty big. They're not flies, um, like what Karen was using. So we developed Heinlein unloading, one of the most popular microgravity analogs. 
And this photo on the left shows a mouse that's Hylum unloaded. As you can see that her tail is suspended by this chain and her back legs are lifted off the ground. So this is meant to mimic weightlessness and to simulate microgravity. And the mouse will remain like this for the duration of the experiment. So that's what we did. And this model is really useful because hind limb unloading and space flight actually result in really similar negative physiological outcomes. And we are lacking a lot of behavioral H2 studies. And if you remember from the title of my presentation, I do have a behavioral component to my project. So that's pretty unique that I get to contribute to the behavioral side of science as well. And now a little bit about the treatment that we use. So we use PLX stromal cells and stromal cells are kind of like stem cells, but they derive into the connective tissue of any organ. And in our case, these stem cells were harvested from the maternal placenta. And PLX pad cells have a lot of therapeutic effects. And they're actually a very promising treatment that have been used in many clinical trials, as you can see here in this diagram on the right. They've also been used in a lot of physiology studies with HU. However, we are still lacking an understanding of the mechanism behind their effects. And this is actually the first study ever to implement PLX pad into a behavioral analysis. Like, so that's pretty cool too. And then again, if you remember from the title of my project, you might have heard this word cytokines. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with cytokines, cytokines are just small proteins released by many different cell types that are really important for cell signaling and immune system function. And very generally, they can be categorized as pro-inflammatory, meaning they induce inflammation, anti-inflammatory, meaning reduce inflammation, or they can participate in regulating activity of different immune cells. So that could be activating an immune cell or suppressing an immune cell. And I'll probably use, well, I definitely use this phrase a lot throughout this presentation, which is cytokine profile. If you hear that, all that means is the different cytokines that are expressed in a tissue or organ, because there are so, so many kinds of cytokines. So that's just a very general way of saying that. So from previous hind limb unloading and space flight studies, we've actually learned a decent amount. And if you follow this flow chart, what you may notice is that microgravity, stress from space flight and hind limb unloading result in very similar negative physiological outcomes, which is super awesome. That's why we have hind limb unloading. Well, it's not awesome that they're negative, but it's good that microgravity, uh, hind limb unloading is a microgravity analog that can capture those physiological changes. So for example, they both result in muscle atrophy, which is just reduction of muscle mass and also inflammation. Hind limb unloading has also been shown to alter cytokine profiles and then increase anxiety and depressive like behaviors. And then inflammation is also linked to anxiety and depressive like behaviors. So hopefully from this flowchart, you can see how there are links between microgravity and space flight and HU and physiological changes, as well as behavioral changes. And we just wanna keep connecting the two and really understanding which drives like this behavior drive the physiology changes and physiology and behavioral um, changes and how that's all connected. So then from previous PLX studies, we have learned that PLX can actually mitigate a lot of the negative physiological consequences that are caused by HEO. So for example, PLX has been used to treat muscle regeneration. And if you remember from the last slide, hind limb unloading has actually been shown to cause muscle atrophy. So that's um, really good to know that PLX pad can treat that. And then when used in combination with hind limb unloading, PLX pad has actually been able to normalize cytokine profiles. So what I mean by that is hind limb unloading has changed the cytokine profiles. So either cytokines are upregulated or downregulated a lot in the HU mice, but then when used in combination with PLX pad, those cytokines are at more normalized levels. So with all that information in mind, and I know that was a lot, so hopefully people kept up with most of it. My study wanted to ask how might PLX pad treatment affect behavior? And is there any correlation between behavior and these cytokine profiles? So again, making a behavioral and physiological link. So now into my methods. 
So for my experiment, we used female mice that were divided into four groups, which are shown in these graphics right here. They were normally loaded vehicle, normally loaded PLX pad, Heinlem unloaded vehicle, and Heinlem unloaded PLX pad. So just taking a step back for a second, when I say normally loaded, it's just a mouse that's in a normal cage. So unlike the HU mice over here that have their tails suspended, the normally loaded mice do not. And then you'll see that their injections right here, these syringes represent that. Um, and the vehicle injections are just a control. So the mice were either injected with the PLX cells that were meant to induce a physiological effect, you know, be therapeutic, be our treatment. And then the vehicle, on the other hand, isn't meant to do anything. It's just our control injection. So they were injected, they were either normally loaded or HU. And then at the end of the experiment, we did the behavioral analysis, which I will get into more in just a second, but pretty much I scored the videos of the mice and I looked for 12 behaviors. And then we also did the cytokine analysis where we correlated different cytokines in the brain and plasma with behaviors seen in the mice. So like I said, for the behavior analysis, I watched videos of the mice and unfortunately I cannot show any video clips, but hopefully this graphic down here maybe helps people get a better understanding of what was going on. So we had a video camera set up in front of all the mice's cages. So they were either, you know, in their normal cage, the normally loaded mice or in their HU cage with their tail suspended. And the videos record, the camera recorded them for 24 hours straight, just, you know, in their cage doing whatever they like to do in there. And that lasted for 24 hours. So we got content from the daytime and the nighttime and all of that. And then I went in and from that 24 hours of footage, I chose four different videos, two from the daytime and two from the nighttime and analyzed them to get a nice well-rounded representation of the behavioral profile of these mice. So when I watched the videos, I would pull a video up on my computer screen and then on another screen next to me, I'd have an Excel sheet to keep track of all the behaviors I was seeing. And I watched and I looked for the 12 behaviors on this slide, which can be categorized into active, inactive and exploratory. So for example, say I started the video in between like zero and 10 seconds into the video, the mouse was eating. So I would, take note of that, put that in my Excel sheet. I did that for all the videos, all of the mice, and then eventually graphed all of these behaviors, which brings me to my results. And I'm not gonna show all the results for time's sake. I'm just gonna highlight the two most important behavioral results and then the cytokine results. So the first most important behavioral result are the active behaviors, which was just a category of behaviors. There's a lot of different behaviors that go under active. And I know graphs can be overwhelming, especially if they're not your own. So don't worry if you don't understand it completely. The main takeaway from this graph is that during the nighttime, all of the vehicle mice, so remember the mice that did not get our treatment injection of PLX, they just got the control. They had significantly higher percentage of active behaviors in the dark cycle, so the nighttime, compared to the light cycle. So this is pretty normal. Mice are nocturnal. We definitely expected them to be much more active during the night than the day. However, our treatment mice, our PLX pad mice, they did not show these differences. So statistically speaking, they were equally as active in the daytime as the nighttime, which is interesting because we didn't really expect that. And then the next behavioral result is our involuntary movement result or sleep twitches. So I think people know what I mean by sleep twitches. I'm pretty sure we've all experienced them before. It's when you're like half asleep, you know, and then you just like twitch or like something kind of wakes you up. Um, so that's what that is here. And again, I know the graph probably looks a little bit overwhelming, but the most important result here is that the mice that were hind limb unloaded, so not in a normal cage, you know, their tails were suspended or microgravity analog mice, they had significantly more sleep twitching than the mice that were not high limb unloaded. So microgravity meant more sleep twitches. That's all this is trying to say. And now onto our cytokine results. So all of these names on here are different cytokine types. And again, don't worry about that. 
The main thing that I want to focus on from these results is what's indicated by the yellow arrows. So all of these cytokines are cytokines that are expressed during REM sleep. So usually during REM sleep, there would be a high level of these cytokines. And what we found is that the mice that exhibited more involuntary movements, so again, those sleep twitches, actually expressed less of these cytokines. So with the increase in voluntary movement, there was a decrease in the um, REM sleep cytokines, so a nice negative correlation there. And yeah, that's, that's really all you need to know from, from this slide. So what can we conclude from all of this? Because I know that was a lot, so let me summarize. The first thing is that PLX pad may alter circadian patterns or sleep patterns in mice. And the reason that we came to this conclusion is because they were not any more active from a statistical standpoint in the nighttime than the daytime, which is unusual because mice are nocturnal. The second conclusion that we came to is that hind limb unloading disrupts sleep. And we came to this conclusion based on the really high levels of those involuntary movements or sleep twitches that we saw in these mice. And then we also came to this conclusion because those sleep twitches were negatively correlated with cytokines that are usually expressed during REM sleep. So all the, both of those things are indicative of sleep disruption. And that is interesting because sleep disruption has so many of its own negative physiological consequences. So if hind limb unloading is really causing a lot of sleep disruption, we should investigate that more. And now onto the significance and future directions. So this study is significant because it's unique in the sense that it does have a lot of space applications. Obviously, we used a microgravity analog. However, it has a lot of non-space applications as well, starting with the fact that it's really important to acknowledge both the physiological and behavioral effects of our PLX pad treatment in order to gain a better understanding of the mechanisms behind its effects to make those all those clinical trials and everything that they're being used for a lot safer. And then from a space standpoint, we really want to solidify HU as a microgravity analog that can address both behavior and physiology so we can continue to better understand links between physiological and behavioral changes as well as just behavioral changes in microgravity and space as well because that's a pretty understudied field at this point. And then we also want to gather data to help introduce PLX pad as an effective treatment for astronauts. And these are just a couple of the future directions. There are so much more than this, but it would be really awesome to first do some specific behavioral and sensory motor tests for both groups of mice, as well as to monitor sleep in all the animals to investigate how PLX pad and HU actually affect sleep, since we did conclude that there's a really high chance that both of them are affecting sleep patterns. We'd also want to use both male and female mice with a larger sample size to reduce our standard error and also to make to come up with the results that are a lot more generalizable instead of just using females, which is great, um, but it's nice to use males and females. And then finally, we would want to implement PLX in actual space flight. So I'm gonna talk really, really fast about an additional project that I'm working on. So this project's called Rad Bread, which is radiation biology research at an elevated altitude through dosimetry. So kind of a lot. And from the title already, you're probably like, wow, this is way different than what you just talked about. Um, but this project is super cool. And is actually the recipient of the 2020 Ames Research Innovation Award. And my team and I are collaborating with Swift Engineering Inc., which is an engineering company in California, as well as the German Aerospace Center to explore the use of Swift's high altitude, long endurance, unmanned aerial, aerial vehicle, which is the aircraft right here on the right as its potential use as a Mars analog and platform for conducting space biology experiments. So I'm just gonna like break this down for a second. Um, so like I said, we can't send every single project that we want to into space. So developing platforms like these aircrafts that fly very high into the stratosphere, I think ours goes about 75,000 feet for two full weeks is super super awesome because because of the like radiation profiles up there and the um, environmental conditions 
it actually has potential to be used as a Mars surface analog. And if that's the case, that's super unique because then we can send our biological experiments on these planes rather than having to send them um, all the way into space. So as of right now, our plan is to implement an M42 radiation dosimeter provided by the DLR, as well as potentially some UV sensors to study how different types of radiation are affecting our biological samples. So I know this was a really fast explanation, but this project is really awesome and it's a really important interdisciplinary and international collaboration. So if anyone has any questions on it, I would be happy to answer them. And then finally, my goals and advice. So my goals are to, is first and foremost to inspire people to pursue space-related research. That's a huge part of the reason why I'm doing this. Um, eventually, I would like to attend grad school and get PhD or master's in some STEM field. I do not know what yet. And then work in the STEM industry to do my own research or project management, hopefully space related, of course. And then eventually, I would like to start a biotech and biology research company that is focused on commercializing, globalizing, and industrializing space biology research. And then finally, my advice for people who are really interested in space. First, space is not just for scientists and engineers. Literally anyone can contribute. We were, we're gonna need all types of professions, all types of people to really optimize space travel. So also leads nicely into my next point, which is to be creative and open-minded. Anyone has the skills to come up with something that could contribute to new technology, new space like discoveries. It's just all so exciting. Um, and there's no idea that's too crazy. And then third, and this to me might be the most important piece of advice, is that we need to accept that we don't even know some of the challenges that we'll face when it comes to microgravity research. Space is so unknown and who really knows what's gonna come up. It's such a new field, especially space biology. We just have to be really ready for anything. And then last but definitely not least is to be excited um, about space. The opportunities for discovery are endless and I'm so excited to see what happens in the future. And then acknowledgements, there's really way too many people to thank, but anyone who's part of SOSDP team, specifically Dr. Linda Rubenstein, who is my mentor last summer, as well as Hami Ray, Sigurd Reinch, and Desi Bridges, which is the SOSDP management, Anyone from Caro Space Grant as well, Sophie Orr was our project mentor, Cassidy Brand, she's one of my best friends, she was on the team, Mary Hansen, who was our student project manager, who's actually on this call right now, so it's really exciting. And then of course, all my family and friends. So thank you everyone, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Alma, thank you so much for this inspiring presentation, for sharing your experiences and also your endeavors for the future. It's really exciting. Um, you dived a lot into the biological parts as well, and it was really interesting. It, it's really great, actually, because this morning, our presentations were more about the human body. So we had um, experiments about the brain and the heart, but in this afternoon, we were able to hear about flies and different experiments done with mice. So it's, it's really great to see a variety of different experiments going on. Okay. So now I'd like to dive into the Q&A. I've seen a lot of questions coming in um, through the chat. If you have any questions, please make sure to write them down now so that we can um, ask all the speakers. And also, um, as my colleague Wenbin has put up, um, if you ha don't have time, please make sure to answer the questionnaire before you leave. You can um, leave the questions in the questionnaire form as well. So make sure um, to fill that in. Okay, so I'd like to move it, move on to the Q&A. So our first question is from Sunny um, and to Karen. So thank you for your presentation. With flies being morphologically smaller compared to humans and rodents, their blood fluid column is also less. Would this be physiological? Would would this physiological difference suggest fruit flies are also less affected by gravity changes and gravity effects on fluid volumes? compared with rodents and humans. Space flight induced fluid shifts play a role on astronaut space flight cardiovascular adaptations. Yeah, that's a really good question. 
Um, and we don't know the answer. Um, it's really hard to measure um, fluid shifts in something as small as a fruit fly. Um, what I can say is, uh, for example, it's thought that fluid shifts in the brain are responsible for some of the uh, visual changes that occur in astronauts. And we see visual changes in the fly, even though there is no hydrostatic or, or fluid component to their eyes. So I think despite the fact that we don't have in the fly probably the same kind of fluid dynamics, I think we probably do have some of the very same basic cellular processes going on. And, and I think that's what we need to understand first. And then maybe there's another overlay of uh, that's presented by fluid shifts, but I think the basic cellular mechanisms are still there and the fly can tell us something about them. Perfect, thank you very much. The next question is actually from Alma to Karen. So do you think that the results would be similar if other highly organized fibers like microtubules were studied? If so, what would be the implications for that? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of um, changes in the overall cellular um, organization in, in microgravity, and that's something that we want to explore. For example, mitochondrial function. Um, we did do some EMs of mitochondria, and there was a huge expansion. It looks like in muscle, and we don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. We don't know if it's because they're changing their metabolic state or is it a failure of mitochondria to undergo their normal processes of fusion and fission. Um, and so that's a very good question and, and something that we intend to look at in future experiments. Should be, we be lucky enough to, to be funded? Great, thank you so much for the clear answer. The next question is also from Sunny. We have a lot of questions from Sunny, thank you. So do you, do you quantify fruit fly activity level? So how much they fly around in their habitat? So is there a difference between flight and ground control? Yeah, so that's, that's also a really interesting question and that new multivariable platform module that I showed has a camera and it has activity areas which will allow us to answer that question. They, I think um, that it has been studied preliminarily um, in the test of the MVP, the original tests of the MVP. And I believe that there's a reduction in activity that you would expect, um, but we would like to be able to get more information um, and so one of the projects that's been under development is trying to get a 3D representation of how the flies are moving around this activity chamber from a, a single camera viewpoint using mirrors and all that sort of thing. And we'll be able to better answer that in the future. But I can tell you that when they come back, there are clear differences. We do climbing assays and flight assays on the flies that come back. And they, they have very interesting movement behaviors in 1G after being all their lives on the ISS. They, they will climb initially just like a, a regular ground control fly, but then they freeze and they literally don't move again um, for, the, for, for minutes and minutes. Um, and I believe this is probably in part due to changes in the metabolism in their muscles. And, and that probably is also uh, translated to the ISS itself and, and probably underlies changes in, in movement behavior. Thank you. The next question is, have you studied direct radiation effects on fruit flies? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so on the ISS, it's still within the magnetosphere of the Earth, and so the radiation effects experienced there are relatively limited. Um, they're there, but they're not, they're not huge. Um, probably a good thing for astronauts. But we had tried to use um, the Russian space uh, agency has these big, they're kind of like a balloon, but they go much higher into the atmosphere or into space than the ISS. And so 
uh, we had hoped at one point to be able to use that as a way to look at the direct effects of radiation, um, but we haven't been able to manage that experiment yet. But that would be a really good way to, to, to look at the direct effects of radiation, which are going to be significant for any one or anything going to the moon. Thank you. Perfect. The next question is going to Alma. So when you mention stress from spaceflight, which stressors are you referring to? So psychological isolation stress, physiological stress like um, cortisol related pathways or environmental stress like radiation? Um, definitely a good question. And I know that it was pretty broad in my presentation, but we are mostly focused on psychological and isolation stress. If you I definitely recommend looking at um, the supplementary slides in my presentation if you want to get into more of the background. But all of our mice, both the HU mice and the um, normally loaded mice, were single housed because we really wanted to capture that that isolation aspect. Um, so ours was kind of like a worst case scenario of um, space flight stressor in terms of like psychological and behavioral. They were all you know, HU'd, single housed, very isolated. So yeah. I hope that answers your question. Great, the next question is, which behaviors were included in the active behavior measurement? So all of the behaviors you have listed on the slide prior to the active behavior data slide. Yeah, so active behaviors, I think there were like seven or eight of them. Um, and they included anything from eating, climbing, drinking, burrowing in the nest, self-grooming, just like walking around. Um, so all of those were, were active behaviors. And again, I didn't show all the results for the time's sake, but we did graph, make those types of graphs for literally every single behavior. And I, I don't even think all of those are in the supplementary slides, but um, there were significant differences in individual behaviors as well between the day and the nighttime, so. Great, thank you. The next question is also to you, um, which is, um, do I understand correctly that this research outcome is solely based on a 24 hour observation of behaviors categorized fairly subjectively? Um, okay, so again, I, I'd say definitely recommend looking at my supplementary slides if you see the timeline. So all the, before any behavioral data was even gathered, the mice were high limb and loaded or in their normal, normal cage for a full 30 days. So they were, um, it was a pretty long time before we actually did any behavioral analysis. And then, yeah, we only ended up getting 24 hours of footage, which is, and I also have a limitation slide in my um, supplementary as well, but that is definitely a limitation because ideally we would have wanted to film before and after the high limb unloading as well as the injections to get to capture any behavioral changes if that makes sense but this is definitely a pilot study and it's just awesome that we got behavioral data in the first place so definitely future studies should look into changing the experimental design a little bit um but yeah thank you the next question i guess is for both of you um which is does one have to keep the creatures so the flies the mice sedated all times or not. So he's asking because of the perturbation they cause. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm flies exactly don't need sure. to be yeah. sedated. <laughs> Amadou, can you answer something about the mice? Wait, sorry, can you say the question again? Sorry. The question is from Madhavan. Um, does one have to keep these creatures sedated all times or not because of perturbation they cause? Um, no, so the mice were only sedated for euthanasia, which, yeah. So throughout the rest of the experiment, they were, they were not. Yeah, flies okay. and worms, they're just sent up and they don't need any sedation at all. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, the last question was from Alex asking about international microgravity projects. Um, 
what I wrote in the chat, and I'll explain again, um, we had in webinar number one, which we had in April, um, to explain about the different UN USA activities that we're doing that is open for um, opportunities for hypergravity and microgravity experiments. But also we had the American Gravity Society, ASGSR, the European one, ELGRA, we also had the Japanese one, explaining about the different activities that they're doing within their community. So if you can um, check that webinar out, it will give you some information about the different things that are going on. And there's a lot of student activities going on, and they're part of a lot of things that um, you can join in. And if there's anything that um, both of you have to add, any um, cool, um, interesting projects that are coming up, or anywhere that you get information about um, existing opportunities, maybe if you can help me with that. Well, NASA has a website, uh, and they they have occasionally what they they have calls, which is uh, reaching out to the community to address a particular question NASA would like to have answered, and um, it's available uh, to anyone, uh, any researcher at an institution to to go and apply for these um, grant monies in order to study different different aspects of spaceflight. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, student opportunities, and I think many of those are listed on the NASA websites. But AS, I'm a member of the AS, I'm on the board of the ASGSR, and we have a very active student group. So that's another venue, as you mentioned, uh, that, that people can check out, at least in the United States. But then there's JAXA and um, ELGRA in, in Europe. So there's, there's plenty of information on those individual websites yeah and just to just to add to that for i don't know how many like students are on the call but there's an asgsr talk on may 22nd that is about careers in space biology and space related research that's open to all students so if anyone's interested in looking into that that's coming up soon Thank you. Yep, um, that's perfect. Because in the first webinar, we had um, members from ASGSR and ELGRA talking about the different conferences they have, and it's re um, relatively open to the public. Um, I know CELGRA, the student body of ELGRA, is doing a lot of interesting webinar series where you can get educational content as well. And this series is trying to become one of them by providing a lot of theoretical knowledge in the different scientific fields. So yeah, if you follow us through the whole webinar series, I think you'll get a pretty good overview of what you can do in hypergravity microgravity. But we'll try to keep um, putting on um, interesting information that can help you um, get more information about the different opportunities and different educational websites or something. So definitely um, we will try to um, put more information on our website. Okay, I think I've gone through all the questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Karen Oker and Alma Lufins for this presentation. It was very interesting and it, it was really great to see the different things that um, we can do in physiology. So thank you both. Before we leave, um, thank you. Before we leave, I'd like to mention that next week from the same time, we will have uh, another webinar about pharmacology. So please make sure to check this one out as well. Um, if you're here, it means you don't have to register. So please don't register. Um, I will send you out the link, but the thing is the link is the same. So you can use the same one that you used today. Also, um, please make sure to answer our questionnaire before you leave. We would really like to hear your feedback and um, we really like to provide you better webinars. So please, you can be brutal with us and please send in your comments. And if you have any questions, also please send in um, that as well. And lastly, if we have any more updates, we will put it up on the website. Of course, we will put the recordings of this webinar on our website as well, as soon as we can. So please make sure to um, check that out and also um, send out the information to any of your friends, colleagues, students, anyone who um, missed out on today's webinar but still have time afterwards. So, okay, I really appreciate all of your engagement in the chat for the speakers, for um, the amazing presentations and answering our questions. So um, thank you so much all. I hope you have a nice day wherever you are and everyone take care and I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.